I'm David Blight, Director of the Gilder Lehrman Center at Yale. Uh, welcome back to another GLC at lunch. Uh, I want to thank uh, my wonderful colleagues here, uh, Melissa McGrath, who did another stunning uh, little poster for this uh, talk. Uh, Daniel Vera, our, our technical and media person who makes this happen. And uh, Michelle Zachs, our associate director who organizes everything. Uh, we welcome back today, Nicola Denzi Lewis, who was a fellow here at the center late last spring in May and June, doing research for this very project. And Brichette Mendoza, uh, who is her co-author and collaborator on this project about mortuary industries. Uh, the freed people in two civilizations, uh, 2000 years and more apart, uh, in ancient Rome, Imperial Rome, and post -bellum, in the postbellum American South, mortuary industries born of the work of freed slaves in both societies. It's, this is the first and second centuries BC compared to um, the late 19th century. Now, I just want to say quickly, as I introduce both of our guests, that Comparative history of this kind used to be a big deal. It used to be a big field. Uh, a lot of departments advocated it, et cetera, et cetera. And it fell into a lull, I think, for years. Uh, and it may indeed be having a, a serious revival, uh, be, I guess, because of globalization uh, and possibly other, other uh, trends, particularly international history. It's hard to judge these things. But thank God for comparative history. How else do we really understand ourselves, so to speak? Um, let me do some quick introductions and get it right over to our two guests who are going to deliver this talk together. Um, Nicola Denzi Lewis is a professor at the Claremont Graduate University. Uh, she's been head of or chair of the Department of Religion there. She's now chair of the Women's Studies Program or Department at Claremont. Did her PhD at Princeton, MA there as well, was an undergraduate at the University of Toronto. She's the author of many books, uh, fascinating works. One entitled uh, Cosmology and Fate and Gnosticism and Greco-Roman Antiquity Under Pitiless Skies. Uh, another called The Bone Gatherers, The Lost Worlds of Early Christian Women. And then also, and I guess this is forthcoming, she's working on it, or maybe it's already out, The Early Modern Invention of Late Antique Rome. Um, and welcome back, Nicola. We enjoyed having you here last spring, and it was all too short of a month that you were here. And that's what uh, brought about this talk. We were gonna have you do a talk back then, but it was already late May and June and it was, you know, people tend to shut down around here. But joining Nicola is her own graduate student here, PhD student, uh, Brichette Mendoza, who's PhD student at the Claremont Graduate School or now called Claremont Graduate University, sorry about that, in the religion department. Um, uh, she has also been involved before her uh, graduate career uh, in American journalism, particularly with the New York Times. She was a full-time producer and a managing editor on The Wire Cutter, which is a service of the New York Times. Uh, she's written for The Wire Cutter and The Times and uh, contributed to national political coverage at The Times. She's was her fellowship, she has received fellowships at the Claremont Graduate School and indeed is working with Professor Lewis. They have written this and prepared this presentation together. So I will then turn it over to both uh, Nicola and Brichette. I believe, Nicola, you're gonna start off and we'll go about 40 minutes as we usually do out there in GLC land and then come back and take questions. So do send us your questions, folks, on either side of this story or both sides of this story. Nicola, over to you and welcome back. Thank you so much. Um, and I really, I, I want to begin with a huge thanks to you, David, and to Michelle Zacks for the opportunity to be here today. 
as well as, of course, for the fantastic opportunity to be a fellow at the GLC this past May. I'm grateful as well for the very kind welcome that they extended to my graduate student, Prashat Mendoza, when she was able to visit the GLC and the Yale campus for a few days during the time of my fellowship. So I'm gonna share my screen at this point and begin. I hope everybody can see that. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Okay. This joint collaborative project that Brichette and I are presenting today actually had its genesis in a transdisciplinary graduate seminar on death and dying in the ancient world in the fall of 2021 at Claremont Graduate University. And although the general orientation of that seminar was towards the ancient world, given my specialization as a social historian of the Roman Empire, the transdisciplinary nature of the course itself invited students to explore mortuary practices from other times and places. And I was immediately impressed by the work that Brichette began building on a national piece on the Natchez slave market that she wrote for the New York Times, along with investigatory and digitization activities that she carried out at the National Archives, tracking down documents related to widows' pensions from those emancipated following the Civil War. These documents reveal a flourishing of new forms of what she calls mortuary expression among freed African-Americans as they sought to define and broadcast their new identities as free citizens. I was immediately struck by what appeared to be a striking parallel between these formerly enslaved individuals' mortuary expressions and the mortuary productions of Roman freed slaves, which frequently display a similar concern for visually establishing and laying claim to their new social identities. Thus, the current collaboration was born and was able to flourish in the rich environment of the Gilder Lehrman Center. The focus or topic of this talk is thus a comparison of two very different times and places. Uh, um, Republican and early Imperial Rome on the one hand and the American South following emancipation. More specifically, we will discuss the phenomenon of the development of adopted, adapted, and new distinctive funerary mortuary culture along a particular subset of the population. That is newly emancipated people, formerly enslaved, who at this point of manumission were faced with the opportunity to recraft their social identities as free citizens. So I have to begin with, uh, with a confession. What I'm going to say here today regarding the Roman evidence follows well-established scholarship. Um, in other words, I am not today breaking new ground. That's why I brought Prichette's work in conversation with mine. The distinctive funerary culture of Roman freed people has been amply explored since Paul Zunker's 19. 75 article, God Willis Wilmischief Freigelassene, and the extensive art historical investigations of most notably Michael Corbosian and Lauren Hackworth Peterson. So, by far the most sophisticated and thorough work on the topic has been undertaken in the last decade by my colleague at Brown, John Bedell, and it would be really a fool's undertaking to try to uh, attempt to improve upon his outstanding work. So, thus, I see today my research aims here as threefold. So first, that's establishing a historical grounding in Roman freedman art and querying whether or not we can use it to determine or speak of a so-called freedman mentality. Second, since most of the scholarship on Roman freedmen focuses quite literally on free men, my chief critique, for example, of Henrik Moritzson's recent extensive book on Roman freedmen, it was the agreement between Brichette and me that we would seek to investigate whether the so-called freedman mentality represented the interests and subjectivity of freed women. Finally, the methodological aim of this research was to think on the issue of broad cultural comparisons between Roman freed people and African-American freed people. And I'll add finally that this is still very much uh, a work in progress. So we're looking forward to your questions and, and thoughts at the end. Yes, and Professor Dinsey Lewis will begin with a discussion of the Roman context or environment uh, before turning uh, over the floor, so to speak, to me uh, to present my work drawn from archival material. Uh, my hope is to indeed break a, a modest measure of new ground, particularly with how my research here is framed by and engages in uh, productive dialogue with hers. 
we will conclude our talk by briefly thinking together on the possible merits, deficiencies, and challenges involved in this comparison and historical analysis. So uh, something we do hope, as she has said, you will help us engage. All right, so to Rome. Well, one of the few things that non-specialists know about Rome is of course, that it was an enslaving society. And there's been a great deal of scholarship in recent decades on Roman slaves, interrogating the legal, social, and economic dimensions of Roman slavery as a system. More recently, the emphasis in scholarship has shifted from slavery as a system to the lives, experience, material culture, and subjectivity of enslaved people. Central to this has been an effort to understand the psychological impact of extreme social marginalization to which enslaved people were subject. In two important articles, John Bedell explored the historiographic shift initiated by classicist Moses Finley, who described, famously described the enslaved individual in Rome as the quintessential outsider, following the terminology of the French sociologist of law, Henri Lebeville. In a remarkable moment of transdisciplinarity, Finley's move away from surveying the ethics of an enslaving society to focusing on the psychology of enslavement proved to be a galvanizing idea for Orlando Patterson, who credited his construction of enslavement in his famous work, Slavery and Social Death, as the permanent violent domination of natally alienated and generally dishonored persons. John Bedell, more than perhaps any other classicist or ancient historian, took up Patterson's and Finley's formulization of slavery as social death, finding it useful to think with in a Roman context. He writes, by natal alienation, all ties of ancestry and kinship are severed, thus creating for the enslaved individual social death. The slave, notes Bodell, was a genealogical isolate, no matter what social bonds he formed in life. The focus of our work has been on freed people, so I don't wanna to spend too much time today talking about Roman slaves, but it's essential to our argument to lay the groundwork for whether or not it is legitimate or even useful to consider the degree to which formerly enslaved individuals sought to correct or introduce a new sense of identity as emancipated, a radical reorientation that we can see reflected in their development of a distinctive funerary culture. To some extent, this depended on whether or not freed people felt the so-called stain of slavery, an attitude which is evidenced from, from Latin literature and nowhere more poignantly expressed than in the character Trimalchio, an ex-slave from Petronius's first century satire, the Satyricon. I'll return to Trimalchio presently. But it wasn't just the Satyricon. In the same century, Seneca lampoons the wealthy freedman Calvisius Silvinus, who, despite his money, maintains a vulgar bourgeois mentality which induced him to train his slaves to memorize Greek poetry as part of his social ambition, although he himself remained ignorant, thus committing the unpardonable tackiness of confusing labor with learning. So at this point, I wanna to turn to Roman mortuary commemoration. Romans drew the style and form of mortuary expression jointly from the Greeks and the Etruscans, favoring when finances allowed, Decorated ossuaries or sarcophagi generally set into mausolea, lining public roads. Enslaved people were rarely afforded elaborate funerals or burials by their enslavers, although the custom was to pr provide them with a decent, respectable interment in the enslaving family's mausoleum or mortuary complex. Neither were slaves given the opportunity to design or execute their own mortuary expressions, whether as funerals or their tombs. We can return here to the theme of social death. As Bedell notes, death and social death thus converge in the deaths of slaves and their descendants. Here, if anywhere, the two worlds intersect and their proximity activates the mechanisms armed on either side to contest the disputed territory where natal alienation, deracination, and oblivion contended with commemoration, continuity, and the establishment of recognized and enduring familial ties. So if slaves were essentially socially invisible, what could a newly emancipated Roman expect when it came to memorialization and identity? What were the limits on crafting a visible self? In exploring this question, scholars have used the example of Trimalchio, the freed slave who fantasizes about designing an elaborate tomb for himself as an important indicator of the freedman's psychology. Yet, of course, Trimalchio is merely a literary invention. 
It's important to recognize actual free people as historical agents who might deliberately manipulate artistic or social conventions to craft a tomb monument that said precisely what they wished to say. Certainly, classicists and ancient historians agree uniformly that Roman free people did indeed feel some compulsion to lay claim to their new social status, and they did so most publicly in their mortuary products. It was the only social class conventionally and explicitly recorded on a funerary monument. Thus, Andrew Wallace Hadro, for example, discusses freed people as innovators of funerary behavior, noting that this social class drew on a traditional conservative vocabulary for the construction of tombs and monuments, yet modified them to suit their own needs for uh, publicly affirming their new social identity. The Roman art historian Michael Corbosian calls their distinctive funerary culture an example of Roman self-fashioning that was available to their social class. So what might these innovations in funerary culture have been? Since at least the pioneering work of Zanker, scholars have detected specific concerns in Friedman art that taken together form a distinctive ex-slave mentality. High among these concerns ranks a desire to emphasize familial and marital bonds, the conferral of citizenship, and visual narratives attesting to successful occupations and the accumulation of wealth. Are these features distinctively and uniquely of the Friedman class? Most scholars agree that they were. Because of time limits, I wanna share only a few images of freed person funerary culture, particularly as it reflects a desire to emphasize familial and marital bonds. In Rome, marriages between slaves or between free and slave were not legally recognized, but enslavers could take enslaved women as wives, providing the enslavers were not of senatorial class. There's modest evidence that freed people were more likely to commemorate their children, which may point to the desire to broadcast, broadcast that their children held freeborn status. So a nice visual example of this is the funerary relief of Publius Servilius Globulus and his parents. Note the father's toga and his wife's pala, stola, and ring, indicating their social status. It's clear from the word conjunct that's used in the inscription that the two are legally married. The boy's freeborn status is indicated by his bulla amulet that he wears around his neck, that's that sort of brown thing you see hanging there, and his toga pretexta worn by freeborn boys. Interestingly here, I think in this relief, the thing that, that really fascinates me is this pillar, which sets off the boy from his parents, which seems to mark his different status from them. This Republican era tome relief has uh, unfortunately lost its inscription, but the imagery leaves no question that this commemorates a family of free people. We find the same emphasis on respectable clothing, denoting social status, and the evident pride with which they depicted their son in the center uh, with his bulla in his toga pretexta. And perhaps the finest example is the image that I chose for the post Romans talk. That's an inscribed funerary relief of Aurelius Hermia and his wife Aurelia Filamatio, freed people who married after their manumission and who were together for 33 years before her death at the age of 40. Their union apparently produced no children. This plaque is a little earlier than the imperial period, so 80, BC, uh, 80 BCE Republican era, but it's significant. It's our earliest material evidence for former slaves, once enslaved in the same household, displaying their new status as citizens in a legitimate legal marriage. In the central panel, the couple share a tender moment. The wife raises her husband's hand to her mouth to kiss it, perhaps a visual pun for her name, Filimatia, which means little kiss. Aurelius Hermia wears the toga exigua, the dress of respectable Roman citizens during the time of the Republic. And their names, which were relatively common among slaves in Rome, indicates that they were of Greek descent and that they took on the nomen gentilicium, that is the family name of their former enslaver, Lucius Aurelius, on the occasion of their manumission. The lengthy inscription where first the husband speaks and then the wife, as if from the grave, is in elegiac couplets. And there's a couple of interesting things in this um, inscription. If you take a look at it, this again, um, the emphasis on how uh, there was a single marriage here, it's my only wife, faithful to a faithful husband. Uh, so the, again, a lot of emphasis here on their marriage. So the emphasis in this tomb relief is not on Aurelius Hermia's occupation as a butcher, which was a, a 
considered a bit of a sordid occupation, but on their conjugal bond. Manumission allowed for them to have a legal marriage, a matrimonium justum, which is signified by Aurelius Hermias's use of the word conjunct, see it in there as well, to refer to his wife. It's a Latin word that could only be used in the case of legitimate legal marriage. <laughs> Excuse me. Slaves were um, uh, ordinarily only allowed to have the status of um, contubernium, which really literally means tent companions. And here, although Hermia puts words into his wife's mouth, right, she actually remained silent. We don't know what she had to say about herself. It's significant that the virtues expressed are those strongly associated with the ideal and idealized virtues of an elite Roman woman. So the suggestion that the formerly enslaved sought to forge new public identities lodged within familial structures in order to counteract natal alienation, deracination, and their status as genealogical islets is easily enough supported then by ample material and visual evidence. To find distinctive mortuary expressions from a Roman freed woman herself, we have fewer examples. Nevertheless, along with the changes that the freed person class was creating in the funerary landscape, Roman freed women did their part to change or adapt to trends in funerary customs. So I only have a, a moment to discuss the well-known case of Nevolea Tuque, a wealthy freed woman who sets up the tomb for her husband, Menatius Faustus at Pompeii. In fact, her husband has two tombs, a more modest one close to the city gates that he had presumably arranged for during his lifetime. And then this much more uh, elaborate one, which Nevolea herself sets up to commemorate the occasion of her husband receiving a bicellium, that is a double width seat in the amphitheater. It's a true status upgrade. And you actually see she put the picture of the seat there um, on the side of the tomb, so you can see it. And situated prominently by the gate of a major road leading in and out of Pompeii, Nevolea Tuque exploited the funerary landscape to demonstrate the importance of her family and to note their public political reputation by her choice of location and the mani material manipulation of tomb type imagery and inscription, she worked within traditions of mortuary commemoration to boast about their affluence and the political triumphs of her husband. Okay, at this point, I'm going to pass over to Brichette to show the material that she has uncovered from the archives. So take it away, Brichette. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to switch to sharing my screen now. Okay. Yes, and I, before I dive in completely, I, I would like to add a few more words of thanks and acknowledgement. I would like to add my own thank you to David White and Michelle Zach for allowing me to join Professor Denzi Lewis at the GLC at Yale during her visiting fellowship with you and to jointly participate in this talk. I also want to express my tremendous appreciation to Professor Denzi Lewis herself for inviting me to carry out this analysis and this talk with her. I would like to acknowledge other faculty from CGU as well and graduate program colleagues who have been conversation partners for me, as have been a number of other people, including those from the National Archives to the Natchez District of Mississippi, residents and National Park Service leadership. Also researchers like Deborah Fontaine and Clarence Ford and Anna Thompson Ford descendant and other descendants of some of the formerly enslaved people whose lives and memorializations are documented in the archival records and shown in portions of this talk. As we move into this segment, I would like to broach the conceptual threads interwoven into our joint thinking. As Professor Denzi Lewis mentioned, John Bodell at, John, at Brown University has in a sense reiterated the value of studying cultural expressions around death as vital to an understanding of, of slavery and uh, the latter being characterized by Orlando Patterson as well as social death. Because these terminal occasions, that is uh, memorializations occasioned by death, function as potentially pivotal sites of experience upon which enslaved people and their descendants often mount profound contestations 
of natal alienation, deracination, and oblivion. Formerly enslaved people have done this through the mechanisms of commemoration, the celebration of their emancipated lives, forging a sense of continuity, and affirming the legitimacy of their cherished relationships and family ties. For the formerly enslaved, funerals, mortuary and burial activities are expressions of not only mourning, but also of a recrafted identity. So we suggest that both in Imperial Rome and the post-bellum American South, these cultural mechanisms function as ways of laying claim to an identity whereby the formerly enslaved and their descendants assert that they are fellow community and society members, citizens entitled to the respect and honor which their neighbors already receive. Therefore, paramount to our attention is the free person's insistence on the acknowledgement of their new social status. Thus, what Professor Denzi Lewis and I have been particularly concerned with is attending to perhaps diverse sources that will allow us to comparatively analyze how free people and their descendants have embraced and shaped commemorations occasioned by death, including funerals and burials, and the associated objects and recollections that they chose to etch out for posterity. These include the funerary mortuary items that they may have purchased and used in ways that asserted their humanity or reclaimed identities. As Professor Denzi Lewis discussed in relation to the Roman context, I also observe uh, in the post-bellum context of the American South. Here as well, we see that freed people took up an interest in asserting the legitimacy of their relationships. Here, we also see that memorialization was an undeniable part of how free people articulated an insistence that they, upon death, be regarded as citizens, to be treated, even if never before, with honor at last. As Professor Denzi Lewis mentioned earlier, I became quite interested in the possibility that there may be value in juxtaposing analyses of the experiences of freed people in ancient Rome with those of freed people in America over the course of a seminar conversation we had last year. And I do continue to believe that this is fruitful work. To elaborate, I came to particular aspects of this research by way of my own positionality, including an awareness of some of my specific ancestry. For instance, there was the influence of the fact that numerous ancestors of mine were enslaved people who lived, served, became formerly enslaved, free people, and died in the American South. More specifically, a number of these enslaved ancestors uh, did all of this in the Natchez district in Mississippi. With my research interest and my professional activities as a backdrop to my scholarly inquiries in graduate school seminars, I had some background knowledge of evidence that Professor Denzi Lewis and I increasingly appreciated for the potential it held to help reconstruct more about at least this one group of people in recent times whose lives and experiences were often not so well documented, namely freed people, both freed men and freed women in the American South. Before I delve into the heart of this talk, that is presenting archival material concerned with mortuary expression pertinent to freed women in the postbellum South, let me back up a little bit, so to speak, and talk about the data set from which I drew my examples. For this talk, I focus on records related to a sampling of freed people. In this case, freed women who were widows of freed men and former Civil War soldiers known as United States Colored Troops. I do this because this record set contains what I view as exceptionally, um, exceptionally rich source material for learning about uh, freedmen's mentality, that is learning about uh, free people in light of their experiences as formerly enslaved people, their identity asserting attempts, their relationship legit legitimizing efforts, and sometimes the claims of their descendants as evidence of their agency and insisting upon 
being able to engage in mortuary expression. The insights are direct and are found in records from relatively soon after emancipation and are accumulated for decades into the postbellum era. Pension files are mostly now located at the National Archives in DC, but some are still in the custody of the Veterans Bureau elsewhere. Some of these files are uh, for the roughly 180,000 African-Americans who served as Union soldiers in the Civil War with the majority, in fact, being raised up from within the South. And many of these Union soldiers were thus formally enslaved. Recent scholarship has revealed that Civil War pension applicants were held to uneven security, a scrutiny rather. Among other aspects of their lives and statuses, they needed to show verification of spousal relationships or marital status. Uh, and this was a task that fell heavier on the shoulders of African-American claimants. This discrepancy was tied to multiple factors. For example, since African-Americans had usually been formerly enslaved and the legal institutions of marriage were unavailable to them on the plantations, their marital status was more difficult to prove. Moreover, their statements were generally regarded with less trust and deemed less credible, in part due to the stain of broad, sometimes even explicitly stated racial stereotypes and often due to continuing suffering of illiteracy by many freed people in the post-bellum period coming out of the antebellum period in which there were legal codes prohibiting them from learning or being taught to read and write. Disparities in the degree of scrutiny applied to the claims were unfortunate, sometimes insurmountable hoops through which claimants were sometimes required to jump. Yet the evidentiary material gathered as a result is a potentially fortuitous aid to modern research. After all, when cases were flagged for further review, special agents and, or examiners were sent to the location of the claimant to investigate further. And while there, they collected detailed evidence, including additional affidavits and depositions. Moreover, claimants sent in supporting documents such as invoices for medical and funerary expenditures and physicians' examinations to substantiate the validity of their claim. In this talk, I will present a very small sampling of records from the files for two women. Their names are uh, Jane Burnett and Anna Thompson, freed women, and the widows of USCT soldiers who were stationed at Natchez in Mississippi during the Civil War. These files are useful to explore because they, like an increasing number of USCT pension files being digitized at the National Archives in DC, uh, are now available for free in the online publicly accessible National Archives catalog. They contain extensive information about lives in slavery and in the postbellum period, including records useful to developing insight into funerary and mortuary expression of concern to us here today. So I've selected the Natchez district to serve as an exemplar of the American South for this talk. And uh, doing this, I, I aim to emphasize that um, for those of us in academia who are interested in investigating, analyzing, and studying slavery, resistance, and abolition, as is the case here at the at GLC, the Natchez district is an important site to consider. Natchez was the site of the second largest slave market in the Deep South, second only to the slave market in New Orleans. The Natchez slave market, known as the Force of the Rose slave market, uh, which operated prior to the Civil War from 1833 to 1863, is now recognized as a National Park Service site, as I reported in my New York, New York Times article. And it is the only site of its kind that is the only site in the entire national park system dedicated to a former U.S. Slave market. Part of the significance of the district rests in the transitions it reflects in the larger US and global economy, movement from the upper South to the lower South, and increasing uh, prioritization of cotton. Natchez reflects the reality of the slave trade beyond the transatlantic phenomenon and the East Coast sites associated with it, inviting more observation of the dynamics of the domestic slave trade and antebellum human trafficking. Natchez is notable because of the multiple co-locations that characterize its history, wealth, 
and enslavement, the slave market, and the Civil War Union Fort, Fort McPherson, situated along the bluffs on the banks of the Mississippi River. Many of the Union soldiers there had been enslaved on the surrounding plantations of the Natchez district. The enthusiastic dismantling of the confining pens and the repurposing of the lumber for the fortifying walls of the town's Union Fort by enlisted soldiers make it a fascinating site for abolition and resistance. Also, although immediately following the Civil War, African Americans in the Natchez district did not have the resources to own their own mortuary businesses. Over time, as is intimated in the pension file records, prominent Southern African American funerary mortuary companies would emerge in the Natchez district. So the emergence of bustling funeral and mortuary industry participation by formerly enslaved people and their descendants is also an element of why the Natchez district can be seen as a site of resistance to be more thoroughly analyzed. I'd like to now focus on the case of Jane Burnett, the widow of a USC soldier, Robert Burnett. Her uh, pension file contains records documenting not only her relationship to Robert, their children, and what was done upon her death, but also insights into the forced migration Jane and Robert underwent during slavery from Richmond, Virginia to the Natchez district. The records in the file show that Jane herself provided more comprehensive pictures of her life and experiences than did others at the time, including her former owner, John Torrey. For example, the Torrey account, though helpful, frames the beginning of Jane's story around the date John purchased Jane and Robert from traders at Natchez. Jane's statements, however, go further. Jane's statements reveal information about what transpired before the couple arrived at Natchez, where John purchased her. As she explains to the pension examiner that she and Robert first met in the slave trader's yard in Virginia. In deposition A, Jane states, I and Robert Burnett were, brought, were bought by Mr. Torrey a number of years before the war from traders at Natchez. I had become acquainted with Robert at Richmond, Virginia, where the traders had us. Her former enslavers records nonetheless do support Jane's assertions of the legitimacy of her relationship with Robert and the children they bore in ways that were otherwise simply not possible. Tory's declarations were viewed as having greater credibility than the statements of formerly enslaved people who had also resided on the Tory plantation and who provided testimony supporting Jane's claim that she and Robert lived as man and wife prior to emancipation. Jane also discusses the surnames she used. She is most frequently identified as Jane Burnett, but she reports to have formerly used the surnames Tory and Harris. As a freed woman, Jane states, my, my name in Virginia had been Harris, but on Mr. Torrey's plantation, I went by the name of my new owner. I took up with Robert Burnett at the slave trader's yard in Richmond, Virginia and lived with him as his wife until his death. Jane's use of surnames is revealing of her modulation of the dominant role of her enslavement in her formulation of her own identity. This provides a sense of the degree of agency Jane exercised, both while she was enslaved and as a freed woman. Upon Jane's death, her daughter Molly procured goods and funerary items from the general merchants in their town of Union Church. The merchants, the Cato's, were members of the Union Church congregation, the same church as Jane and Robert's former enslavers, the Tories. Union Church had been founded by and for the neighborhood's early settlement of Scottish families. And beyond selling the items to Jane's daughters uh, for her funerary commemoration, there is no evidence in the file that indicates that the congregation had contributed to Jane's funeral and burial. I'd like to next turn our attention to 
the case file of Anna Ford. Uh, Anna Ford was a widow as well of a Civil War uh, soldier, Madison Ford. Actually, the poster for today's talk contains an image of the invoice for the hearse used for Anna after her death. However, uh, before we talk about what was done to commemorate Anna upon her death, let's talk about what we learn of her life and experiences. Anna Ford's pension file contains accounts about her life prior to and during slavery, um, during the Civil War and during the postbellum period. Through multiple depositions, we hear from Anna herself in her words. She narrates after the war in this file as she is applying for this claim and others in the neighborhood do as well. Neighbors, both black and white, uh, come to talk about Anna, her deceased husband, their relationship, their children, their life on the plantation, health, ailments, death, before and after the war, and in doing so also shed light on their lives and the broader historical context. So in other words, this is about Anna Ford, but it is not just about Anna Ford. A special examiner was sent to investigate Anna's claim. John C. Williams, the son of her husband's former slave owner, appears before the pension examiner to describe the antebellum marriage of Anna and Madison Ford. His account supports Anna. Anna must also identify the children she had with Madison and their dates of birth. John G. Geis, the son-in-law and administrator of the estate of Anna's former slave owner, Nathaniel Kennison, brings the list of slaves, listing them in families. I found it to be somewhat surprising and noteworthy that in 1877, even some two and a half decades after the war, after emancipation, the administrator of the estate, the son-in-law of the former slave owner, comes and is still holding on to this list of the formerly enslaved people held before the war by the family. Anna and John C. Williams had also doubted that that list would still be held. Yet, that is what we see embedded in this file. We see this expert slave list showing Anna's family in an exhibit preserved within Anna's file. John Geist's list is consistent with what Anna had said, but contained more detailed birth dates than Anna could offer because she was denied literacy to have recorded the precise birth dates on her own children. But of course, they were documented, as was customary in the state records of the slaveholder's family, as part of the estate's pre-emancipation property holdings. Anna's children appear elsewhere in the file, as the ones who go to provide her with end-of-life care and to secure the funerary items for her upon her death. Notably as well, there is no indication that the estate of either Anna or Madison's former slaveholders contributed. The procurements were made by Anna's descendants as we see with the invoices and correspondence in this file. In the archival material we have for Anna, we see evidence that hints at what is transpiring in the mortuary industry in particular, uh, pointing to some of the dynamic and interplay between African-American mortuary providers and their white counterparts. So for example, the invoice for the hearse from J.H. McBride, the white undertaker included in the collage image for this talk, presents one piece of what is occurring. And the other piece was the involvement of the African-American undertaking company. The Natchez Colored Undertaking Company supplied Anna Ford's royal purple coffin and box. Clearly eager to secure further future patronage and uh, business from this lost stricken family and uh, likely competitive edge. R. L. Johnson, secretary and treasurer of the Natchez Color Energy Company, leaves a note at the bottom of the invoice thanking them for their order and buying for additional future business through a declaration that the colored undertaking company would be willing to go the distance to serve their mortuary needs. There is no comparable message of courtesy to Anna's family on the invoice from J.H. McBride. This distinguishing style of mortuary industry care in the approach of African-American mortuary providers to 
African American descendants of formerly enslaved people is one that becomes an increasingly defining one in the postbellum American context. So wrapping up with Anna, we see that Anna's children secure and make their claims for items for Anna as a freed woman that during slavery would not have been secured for her as an enslaved woman, representing funerary expressions that would have not been accommodated by how their lives were structured in slavery. And now uh, a word on comparative historical work. Brachette and I agree that mortuary culture is a good lens for comparing the evolving identity constructions of free people. Rome and the post-Civil War South share, therefore, the pervasiveness of personalizations in mortuary commemorations. In both contexts, formerly enslaved people had the opportunity to narrate their experience and their new embeddedness in legal matrimony and family units. For both Roman and African-American freed people, a primary aim was reifying familial ties, putting an end to the deracination, natal alienation, and genealogical isolationism that marked their existence as enslaved human beings. In addition, the extant material culture of mortuary expression ensures that we hear from formerly enslaved people directly, a relatively new turn in historical studies, rather than merely about them. This is particularly the case for formerly formerly enslaved women who might newly appear as social actors in the reformed cultural landscape. On the other hand, as a Roman historian, I have long insisted on the importance of context and that cultural products are almost never transitive. As the Roman historian Costas Philosopolis has noted on this very topic, despite the value of such comparative studies, the US South is in many ways a very peculiar case which can lead to very misleading impressions once we do comparative work. The very real question remains, is there a danger in creating an essentialist definition of freed people's identity that claims a trans-historical nature? Roman slavery as an institution was grounded in very different principles than American slavery. It was to begin with temporary. Roman law as well as literary sources indicated that slaves who had been sold into slavery as prisoners of war could expect to be freed after perhaps five to six years, any longer was considered punitive. There was a legal age for manumission, that's 30, except in special circumstances. The temporary nature of slavery was undergirded by the idea that to some degree slavery was, just as the Roman jurist Florentinus claimed, an unnatural state instituted by humans rather than because of any inherent physical, racial, or ideological inferiority of the enslaved. The very word for slave in Latin, seruit, uh, derived from serati, had been having been saved from death by their capture as prisoners of war. The relationship between former enslavers and the formerly enslaved is both difficult to access through the material record and bound to have been complex. While free people were given a fixed place in Roman society and were able to earn income, even if a portion of this was paid to their former enslavers, free people in the American South had jobs, including agricultural work, but uh, after slavery were frequently not paid comparably for their work. Moreover, as far as the mortuary industry and other upwardly mobile economic paths were concerned, there were efforts in fact through the middle of the 20th century to exclude them from equal participation. For Romans, abolition was never quite an issue, needless to say. And that in and of itself may render, or at least in some perspectives, an apparent similarity between mortuary culture and commemorative performance between Romans and African-Americans as entirely moot. In the place of abolition, the manumission of Roman slaves was individual, local, intimate, in the sense of being restricted to extended household, and depended on a relatively organic reframing of the social relationship between enslaver and the formerly enslaved within a broader context of society where each individual was expected to perform her duty or his duty based on social class. To bring this talk to a close, I want to emphasize that Brachette and I necessarily had to focus on only a couple of examples out of what is a very rich data set. It can be dangerous or at least misleading to pick and choose in the manner in which we did, 
But nevertheless, our investigations strongly suggest that there are significant similarities between Roman free people and African-American free people, if only in terms of expressing what was important to share about their lives, marriage, family, continuity, respectability. Most significantly, what we've attempted to do, to do here is an exercise in doing history from below, reconstructing the lives of subaltern groups and thinking of tiny but, in, but significant instances of agencies as free people work to be active subjects in control of their own histories and playing their part as historical agents in their respective societies. And thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for this uh, fascinating presentation, both of you, uh, Brichette and Cola. I was going to ask as my first question, exactly what you both have just addressed, which is what makes comparison work? How do we know when we have a comparison? Uh, what does it take? Uh, and you might both reflect on that a bit more, but I had another question too. And, and we welcome everybody's questions out there. Um, what sort of suggestions do, do, does your evidence in both cases, what sort of suggestions are there about images and visions of afterlife? Is there a comparative history? I mean, are, are you going there? Is it possible to go there with mortuary art? Maybe not. But are, are, you know, what, what were visions of afterlife in Imperial Rome? What were visions of afterlife in this largely, I presume, Christian environment of the, the postbellum American South? Uh, so start with those two. If you want to say anything further about what indeed you've learned about what makes comparison work and this question of afterlife, just curious. And we have other questions coming in, so. Sure. Okay, um, I, I'll jump in. In terms of the afterlife stuff, and, and Prashad, I'll allow you to talk about anything in the afterlife um, in the African American context um, in the South. The, what you find on Roman freed people's stones is not anything too explicit about an afterlife. And this is very, this is very typical of all Roman funerary art, but you do find um, a, a tendency to show um, uh, self-divinization or um, images of the freed people um, as a god. So that in a sense, that is a sort of afterlife, right? I mean, this, this um, idea that you can kind of self-divinize and show yourself as Venus or so show yourself as, as Hercules or, or so on. Um, it's very distinctive to free people art. Again, uh, of course, the emperor was someone who very famously is, is divinized, but the Roman elite don't show themselves in the guise of gods, um, but, the, but the free people do. So that's a sort of interesting kind of moment there, right? Where they claim that particular um, style or um, self-presentation, which has been sort of um, looked down on uh, both by elites at the time and by modern scholars as a kind of tremendous act of um, hubris or presumption. So. Yeah, and I would say too, within the American context uh, for formerly enslaved people, the language and imagery of homecoming as a major trope in terms of funerary expression is something that does kind of tie into this, right? So this, um, these um, images and vision uh, are, yes, very much inflected with a, a, a Christian vocabulary and vernacular, but it does uniquely speak to the, the needs and aspirations of free people, formerly enslaved people, who this is their homecoming and in some ways final emancipation from the conditions of slavery within their lives or those of their, their ancestors. Uh, Brichette, as an Americanist and a person who's spent a lot of time studying emancipation, uh, could you say another, and by the way, uh, it's not the sexiest photograph to put in a PowerPoint, but I loved your photograph the pension file boxes. I mean, <laughs> that was cool. I'm not seriously. I mean, there are thousands of them, as you know, and nobody ever puts up pictures of the boxes of their file. I, I love that. I just love that image. I, I've been there. <laughs> uh, but why? Why all these military pension records 
as a source for this. Um, yes, yeah, so that's kind of a our audience that may not all be Americans yeah. here understand why yeah. that was such a source for what you were looking for. Yeah, and I would say that the, the, the pension files are not alone in being a source. And kind of what I'm suggesting here, we have a lot of um, great sources that we can start to, or not start to continue to um, sort of uh, investigate and explore the perspectives of formerly enslaved people and get more um, granularity in our understanding of what their lives were like and what their, their um, mentality was, what their aspirations were. Um, but what I find in these files is that um, you have this sort of rich diachronic records that um, so a lot of times you may have information decontextualized, right? Um, you may have one narrative or one, uh, you know, even in terms of um, if you're looking at a, a, a tombstone or headstone, right? You have a, an isolate, right? But within the context of files, we're getting a multi-perspective uh, multi uh, approach to uh, to actually identifying what the the life has been and what people have thought in in real time to a certain extent. So um, that's why I chose to go here uh, with this particular topic. It's kind of unique, I think, in how these various disparate um, records are all together. And yes, you do have the job of making sense of how they go together and where there are contradictions at times or. Um, whether one thing clarifies another, but certainly it's it's such a rich uh, source of material because you have so much and from different perspectives all in one place. Yeah, and that big that big horrible awful war produced more documentation than anything that ever had happened in America. Absolutely, and all kinds of social history you can do in military records, pension records, and so on and so forth. As armies keep records. Um, we're getting uh, we're getting other good questions here. Here's a question from a person at the University of Dayton. Uh, everybody's thanking you for a great presentation. Maybe, maybe you can read this. I don't know if you can. Mm -hmm. Asking about the invoices, right, Nicola, uh, that draw mm -hmm. attention to the investments people are making mm -hmm. in the funerary art. Uh, what about that? Uh, might it be a direct response to the realities of burial for enslaved people? How is this a, a, an assertion of identity that they can afford this? I mean, mm -hmm. what about identity, dignity equals investment? Uh, I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's an interesting question. Yes, and so I think that's a really interesting question and actually kind of highlights some of what we see as well across the two contexts that what people are doing is sort of investing, right, into this, this recrafted identity. So it's not just sort of retrospectively looking back and remembering something, but they're making an assertion about who they are from present moving forward. Um, they're articulating, you know, this is how we're partaking of something that um, is, 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 is in some way typical in some ways, but you also have people who are, are free people doing this with, unique gusto, right, um, sort of leaning into um, that investment uh, through something as basic as how they're memorializing their loved ones. So yeah, I think that's really key to focus on that it's in some ways an investment. So kind of very forward looking for people. And it, it, we do find it across the United States, by the way, but it's particularly, um, I think, meaningful that people, formerly enslaved people in the South are now going and saying, okay, this is, I'm explicitly investing in this um, behalf of our families in particular. Yeah, I, I agree in that, if I can just jump in there. I mean, it's absolutely um, a, a phenomenon that you see in, in the Roman context. And, you know, the slaves would have had a decent burial. There are also funeral uh, associations, which slaves are allowed to join if their um, enslavers are not going to give them a, a proper burial for one reason or another, they can join a burial association, which will give them a decent burial, um, give them some sort of a memorial. But for those who had the means to do so, it absolutely was crucial, right? To have the most elaborate, most detailed, most, you know, biographically oriented, pathos driven, you know, um, funerary monument to show that you were there. And I love this, this language, this idea of it really being an investment because it is, it's public. It had to be public. Um, and it broadcasted again, not just 
um, the familial ties, but um, wealth, right? The, they were they were newly made people that they were able to be on that landscape like that in a way that was enduring. And the grapes, by the way, are really for themselves. Um, Romans didn't make grapes for their children. So they're not really family crypt. They're there to show this couple. And if they have any children who predecease them, of course, they're in there. But otherwise, they're not set up in perpetuity for for the family as it goes. They're retrospective, right? So. right. And statements by adults that we are people recognized by the state or to some degree, if that, if that translates, you know, <laughs> into the second century BC or the first century BC. Here's a question about pension records, uh, Brigitte. Uh, this person says, if pension records, if he's correct, or she, I request the women of black soldiers during the Civil War were entitled to deceased husbands' pensions for the service in war. Is this true? Were the men killed in fighting or simply that they had died? In, in other words, explain that context of pensions. Who got pensions? and who could apply for pensions? Because that got be a very complicated story for black Americans. Yes, so and it, you know, initially the soldier, you have a couple of different scenarios that happened and this changed over time. So various acts updated the eligibility of um, pension file benefits. Um, and so you, you do see as, as um, particularly um, black women, uh, widows, and they were not necessarily all widowed in the process of the war, right? So some of the soldiers come back home, yeah. right? Yeah. Had come back home, yeah. Yeah. yes. And they they were receiving benefits as well. And then they died. You actually see these multi-layered um, document sets within the files, multiple sets of depositions and so forth, some related to the soldier's immediate claim. And then you see um, the the wife filing her own claim. And that's what we have here. And this is where you get a lot of where they're now saying, okay, I have to now confirm for you that I am this spouse, you know, I, I was there all along. We were always married, you know, and um, and then they are getting uh, benefits as well. And initially um, it was more confined to uh, proving disability resulting from service in the war. And it was later opened up. And so they come in and to varying degrees of awareness apply to that. So that's something that affected uh, African-Americans disproportionately as well. When certain benefits did open up, they were less informed that they were eligible for them as well. So uh, it's, it's, it is kind of um, exciting to see them say, okay, we can um, engage in a conversation with the Bureau um, for things like, uh, you know, uh, the funerary materials for a, a widow of, of this war soldier, which is something that they were doing in later years. And a related question, Brichette, uh, uh, from one of our most loyal viewers here, uh, but about this question of dignity. And as part of that, she's wondering, did African did African American freedmen write narratives on their funereal memorialization in any way com comparable to the Romans or to the Roman world? Did they actually write their stories on gravestones? And of course, that's that's asking a lot if you only got a small stone or you can only afford a small stone if you have a stone. In other words, did you look at grave sites as well as <laughs> records? <laughs> yes, yes. So, so the, compa the comparison at, at literal direct one, one comparison would be the gravestones themselves, right? And yeah. so um, what we don't see, we don't see that level of detail in the numbers as Professor Nathalie talked about. This is something that's, um, characteristic of free people within the Roman context. You don't see that within the American context. A lot of the times the stones are very similar to the people in the surroundings and by socioeconomics. So you don't see these sweeping narratives um, that you would find in Roman stones. Um, probably so, buying from the same companies that make right. the stones. Right, yes, right? exactly. So, yeah, okay. yes. That's what makes great stones. Yes, and there's stri striking similarity. You, if you're walking through the cemeteries, that by just the stones themselves, you may not be able to tell, you know, whose gravestones they are. So they're not um, inscribing those with, with that um, trajectory of what their life has been with respect to slavery. Um, and what we do see, though, and why this sort of record set is very useful, is yeah. because when they did get um, headstones. And we find, and this is being well documented, right? So cemeteries across the country, if you compare those of um, people who were formerly enslaved and just African-American uh, cemeteries in general, 
tend to fall into disrepair um, at a greater uh, speed and to a greater extent than their um, non you know, African-American counterpart cemeteries. And so there's erosion that happens to the stones. So even if there were these great, um, great um, narratives and great accounts that many of those things would have been lost, unfortunately. So this is why we do look to other ways to substantiate what um, they did achieve in terms of um, their own expression. Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, and Nicola, you want to take up this last question from Madison Rolls about mm -hmm. the burials and burial sites. Yeah. The elite versus others uh, in the Roman context. Yeah, there's a lot packed into this question. It, it's a great one, but it, I'll try to, to answer it briefly. Um, well, first of all, in terms of the ex the extracting a first-hand voice, it's super difficult because funer funerary language is, of course, very formulaic. Yeah. Uh, so even in the case that I, I showed you um, of uh, Aurelius Hermia, um, you know, he, you've got a butcher who was, um, we're sure, not literate and uh, has a tombstone that's in these elegiac couplets, right, where he extols the virtue of his wife using language, which is very distinctive of elite um, women's burials. You know, who's coming up with this, right? He has presumably the money to hire somebody to compose this verse, and she speaks from the grave, but it's not her at all. So um, the style of it is really kind of drawn from elite art. It, it's, not, um, it's not firsthand in any way, right? So what we try to do is look for this kind of the slight differences or um, changes or, you know, any kind of modification or innovations there um, to, uh, to draw us kind of away from the standard language. So that's kind of a part of it. The, the elite family columbarium and columbaria exists only for a, a relatively short period of time as a burial phenomenon. Um, so we have really interesting slave burials, which are um, within family estates, where there's a little bit of hints given to the lives of those people. I mean, whether it's occupational or um, there's a couple that I that I nearly put in the show of um, slave women, Verne, who had been um, murdered, um, and they were in they were commemorated by their enslavers. Um, so there are interesting stories in there too, but essentially if free people had the money to do so, they would buy up the best real estate to which they had access, uh, the most public placement, um, and tell the best story that they could within the limits of that away from um, the more elite burial sites. So I hope that kind of <laughs> crunches that stuff in together. Well, listen, uh, I think we've pretty much run out of our time, but I wanna say finally, uh, there's still another question or two here that, that you, you can see from the Q&A. Mm. The idea that this came out of a death and dying course or the beginnings of it is fascinating because we probably all know most, I don't know, most courses on death and dying tend to come in psychology departments, uh, tend to be all about the last 20 years, 30 years and so on. When there's a whole literature on death and dying. But here you are doing this in the deepest historical sense. And I mm -hmm. think it's wonderful. Every, everything ought to, well, in my humble view, everything ought to start that way. Anyway. <laughs> uh, and so, Brichette, all the best of luck with your project. Can't wait to hear about it and read it. And apply for your own GLC fellowship. Come on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Nicola, thank you. Uh, come back anytime. Uh, this was a great talk. We love this kind of comparative history, you know, this kind of uh, subject topic that that surprises everybody. This is, this, is, this is what it's about. So this was terrific. And we had 30 people on. That's why we kept these things on Zoom, because people can connect. So again, thanks, Nicola, so much, and Brichette, so much. Good luck to both of you. Keep in touch. And thanks to everybody who tuned in today. See you Thank all. you, everybody, for coming. Hi, Ashley. We'll get to your question afterwards. <laughs> uh, it's a friend of yours? Okay, you can write to It's a student, me. yes. Oh, a student. Oh, dear. Oh, she was feeding you a good, a good fat pitch yes, there. She is. We'll, we'll, we'll pick up Ashley later for the okay, thanks for, for tuning in, Ashley. Okay. Oh, oh, good. Sorry, I didn't get to it. Anyway, no. Thanks to both of you very much. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much again. It's been a, a real pleasure. 
and same here and uh, see everybody out there